our page uh, at cncf.io forward slash webinars. And with that, I'll hand it over to Web and uh, Ajay and to kick off today's presentation. Excellent. Thank you so much, Ariel. Thank you so much, Julius, for helping us get set up here and, and for having us today. And thanks to everyone on the, the call. Really excited to, to talk about Kubernetes cost allocation, uh, how to get it right, why it's important to get right, et cetera. Uh, this is one of our favorite topics. Uh, so we'll try to go through a lot quickly. Um, looking forward to, to any and all questions like Ariel mentioned, please feel free to drop them in the Q&A um, and we'll get to them towards the end of the talk. But we can also follow up afterwards if you want to learn more um, about Kubernetes cost management, cost allocation in general. So without further ado, let's, uh, let's dive in. So first, I'm joined by my esteemed colleague, Ajay. Uh, Ajay and I worked together at uh, Google for a long time before starting this effort. Uh, Ajay as an infrastructure engineer and myself as a product manager, uh, we both worked on various systems throughout, uh, throughout Google, primarily on uh, monitoring and performance systems. Uh, we worked on uh, solutions like, you know, the predecessor to Kubernetes, that's Borg, uh, Firebase, uh, other internal infrastructure and cloud products within Google. Um, so, you know, we've been thinking about these problems for, for a long time. Ajay actually built multiple billing systems uh, before we, we started this project. So, a little bit of background about the, the project and, and company behind the project. Um, Ajay created the KubeCos open source project in early 2019, uh, specifically aimed at tackling the problem that we're going to be discussing today, Kubernetes cost allocation. Uh, the company behind the project is called Stackwatch. Uh, our company aims to provide comprehensive cost and capacity management solutions uh, for enterprises, medium and, and large size enterprises on uh, Kubernetes based infrastructure. Uh, and like I mentioned, you know, before starting this project, we were thinking a lot about the same problems while working at, at Google and, and other companies. So first, first a quick overview on kind of what we're going to be talking about today and, and kind of, you know, put it in context. Um, Kubernetes cost allocation, in our opinion, is an incredibly interesting problem, uh, but it's not just interesting in and of itself. It unlocks a bunch of other really interesting you know, features and, and functionality within a team and, and company in general. Um, and specifically, when we start working with, with teams, oftentimes cost visibility in Kubernetes environments is a black box. We're going to talk about why that is, but oftentimes teams just receive, you know, a more or less a bill at the end of the month and don't really have visibility into what's actually driving spend within individual applications, you know, teams or even developers, et cetera. So, you know, once teams do have that visibility, they can then do a lot of things uh, with that new, those newfound insights, uh, specifically things like cost monitoring, uh, budgeting, actual, you know, financial chargebacks, uh, predictions, uh, dynamic optimizations, and a lot more. Um, so we think, again, that this is an interesting problem, an important problem in and of itself, but uh, beyond that, it really unlocks a lot of upper opportunity above and beyond just answering this question. So a little bit of background, uh, you know, why is uh, Kubernetes cost allocation hard? And it really comes down to this, you know, first and foremost, this like, you know, multi-tenancy problem. Uh, specifically, once teams move to Kubernetes, it's very common that you're running multiple applications, you know, multiple teams, multiple departments, et cetera, on shared infrastructure, specifically shared VMs. Um, from our opinion, Adrian Ludwin from Google has an amazing CNCF talks on, talk on all the, uh, the benefits of multi-tenancy. Um, to, to try to distill it down, we think that it uh, presents the ability to drastically reduce cost. Um, you know, getting visibility uh, right is one part of actually realizing those cost benefits. But secondly, it actually improves velocity. Uh, when you're delivering applications to, to your users. Uh, so this is kind of one of the, the core reasons why this problem is hard. And specifically what's hard about it is it's, it's hard to 
have all of these shared resources, and then be able to accurately and you know, precisely answer what is the cost of a single application, a single deployment, a set of teams workloads, uh, the cost of even de delivering an application to a single user. Um, all of these questions and answers get unlocked with answering this you know, cost allocation problem. So that's kind of the first reason why this is challenging. The second is that as teams move to Kubernetes, you now have all of these amazing tools, many of them open source like cluster auto scaling and and HPA and like you know, highly scalable jobs and daemon sets. And, and what it oftentimes leads to is a really dynamic environment, oftentimes way more dynamic than uh, what teams were doing pre Kubernetes. Um, and so again, this creates this challenge of understanding, you know, all of these moving parts and how they fit together and ultimately the, the impact on cost. So it's these two reasons that make this, you know, an especially tricky problem to solve. And now, you know, not all hard problems are, are worth solving. Let's take a minute to say, you know, why we feel that this is, is really important. Um, and let's start with, you know, oftentimes, again, when we meet with teams for the first time, cost visibility is really a black box. Like we said, they kind of get a bill at the end of the month, and it's hard to kind of break that down. And so that typically leads to, to two things. Uh, the first is just general you know, waste, right? So, so inefficiency when it comes to resource usage and overall spend. And at the end of the day, it's the like age old saying, you have to you know, measure what matters and it's really hard to optimize or be efficient when you don't have this visibility, when you can't answer what the cost is for you know, this team's workloads versus that team's or this application versus another application. So that's really part one. And then the second, is it's oftentimes really hard to make you know critical uh, company and, and financial level decisions without this information. Uh, so you know at the management level to be able to say you know what is the cost or the marginal cost of supporting a new customer, for example, or the you know the average cost for our enterprise tier customers. All of those things are really hard to answer without this visibility. Um, and then once you kind of do unlock this this problem, uh, we see a. a a lot of you know short-term as well as long-term benefits. Um, first is it's oftentimes really easy to catch you know major mistakes or expensive bugs a lot faster. That's because with this again you can have things like budgeting and alerting specifically around cost. Um, Jay and I have seen a, a lot of war stories over the past year and a half. Anything from accidentally you know leaving a large machine learning cluster. Um, running over the weekend or you know even uh, Bitcoin miners in a Kubernetes cluster that could be really expensive uh, and when these controls in place uh, and visibility in place you can catch that a lot faster but then uh, oftentimes even more important is what we've seen is with this visibility we start to see teams just develop a culture of awareness and, and accountability and specifically, we see kind of the transition from, well, I don't really know what my application is going to need. So I'll just give it, you know, two full CPUs. And, you know, I know at that level, I probably won't have performance issues. Here, you actually can start to communicate and create transparency with application developers for them to actually understand, you know, what their applications and what their particular workloads are costing them. And that can be done across, you know, dev, staging, prod, et cetera. So that's, you know, again, a, a real long-term benefit that we see. And then the third is you can actually start doing these things dynamically. So once you have this base level visibility, you can actually really start dialing things in and making you know, very specific trade-offs when you talk about and, and can think about, again, the like marginal cost of, um, you know, an additional resource to a particular application compared with the marginal benefit for your users. So you can really start to think about, say, you know, what is the actual cost of reducing our response times by an extra, you know, 100 milliseconds or something. And that's where you can really start to fine tune, uh, you know, these trade offs as it applies to not just your, you know, specific engineering and infrastructure practices, but your company overall. So with that background, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, determining the cost of a workload, because at the end of the day, all of this starts with determining the cost of an individual container or pod. 
From there, we can do any aggregation to the cost of a deployment, a stateful set, a namespace, even a cluster. And in our view, the right way to do this is to have a three-part equation. Specifically, we want to first look at the amount of time that a pod or workload was in a running state. So we'll talk about this in more detail, but this is you know, directly talking to the Kubernetes API to, to see the state of that actual workload. Um, the second part is looking at the amount of resources that this particular workload was consuming while it was in that running state. We'll talk about you know, the nuances and details here. And then third is the price of the actual resources that this particular workload was consuming. So again, this three-part equation to determine the cost of an individual container or workload. So we can then do that aggregation and say the cost of a team or an application or a department, et cetera. So let's take a second to walk through kind of each one of these individually, and then we can go into kind of a real world example. Uh, so the first that we mentioned is just this time in a running state. Specifically, again, this looking at the, the Kubernetes scheduler to actually see when a pod is actually in a running state. And once it's in a running state, it can actively be consuming or reserving resources. You know, that applies to CPU, you know, memory, GPU, et cetera. The second part of this is the amount of resources consuming. We feel very strongly that this should be a function of a, the maximum of requests and usage. So if an individual container is requesting a lot of resources, but is actually using very little of them, they should actually be billed for that request, specifically because the Kubernetes scheduler would actually be reserving, for example, that memory for that particular workload. So it's having an impact on other tenants and their ability to be able to be scheduled on that particular VM or node. Alternatively, if you have a workload that doesn't have a request, we, we would look at the actual usage. So here, Ajay will talk about kind of architecture and how we sample this, uh, but we'd be looking at just usage over the relevant time period when you'd be looking to measure cost. And so then the, the third part of this, again, is you know, the cost of actually consuming, or excuse me, the, the price of the actual resources being consumed. And I think this is best kind of you know, talk through a, a real live example. Uh, um, but here you can think about it. You want to actually account for the, the VM where this particular workload is being run. So specifically the cost of say, you know, an N1 standard in US East one that is on demand is likely gonna be very different than the cost of an N1 standard in uh, you know, US Central One that is preemptible. So specifically, we would be looking at where these resources are being, are being run and the actual costs of those individual you know, components. So with that, I'd love to give a really quick demo uh, that is, is built on top of the actual uh, coop cost open source cost model. So in this demo, we can see a UI where we are looking at cost by namespace over the last one day. And let's take a look at what we're actually seeing here. So we're actually <clears throat> seeing two high level categories of cost, uh, one in cluster, and then second out of cluster allocation. Let's talk about the in cluster components first. Specifically here, we'd be looking at anything that is being consumed by workloads in this Kubernetes cluster. So things like memory, compute, network egress cost, storage, and GPU. And then externally, we would be looking at externally managed resources that are closely tied to this particular namespace or individual tenant. So an example there may be that, you know, a, a Kubernetes tenant is using a cloud storage bucket or an S3 bucket, or they're using an, an RDS database or you know, a cloud SQL database. Um, 
we would two costs would give you the ability to do that allocation back to the individual tenant. So like we mentioned, once we've established the cost of an individual workload, we can do kind of any arbitrary allocation here or, or aggregation. Right here, we're showing namespace, but we can look at this data by individual controller. Um, we can look at this data if we just want to look at, say, you know, deployments. Uh, we can look at, you know, just daemon sets. We can actually look at allocation by individual label or annotation. So in this case, you know, this product uh, allocation actually maps to the app Kubernetes label. And so here we see that, you know, we have different applications running them. Some workloads actually don't have this label apply. So again, all of this is built, all of these aggregations are built on that underlying three part equation where we look at the cost of an individual workload. So let's dive in in, in, in a specific example to take a closer look in this live environment. So here again, we're looking at data by namespace and we're looking at say the kube cost namespace let's take a look at the actual memory cost in this particular of, of workloads in this particular namespace so as you can see here this would be broken down to the individual pod and then container level obviously again we're looking at workloads in the kube cost namespace and here we would see the implementation of that three-part equation so we were looking at cost over one day so we'd see you know, workloads running up to 24 hours. We then would be looking at the amount of resources that they are consuming. In this case, again, it's gonna be based on the maximum of request and usage. And then third, we'd be looking at the actual cost of memory or the cost of a GB hour specifically on this particular node where this particular um, workload or container was running. And so obviously if you had a, a workload that you know, came up on, on one node and then went down on the other, you could have two very different costs of running that particular workload. Um, and then you would do that aggregation for all three components and then sum across the individual nodes where that workload has been running. So that's just a, a real life example of again, how this calculation is happening at the, the individual container level. Um, once you have that, there'd be, like we said, a lot of functionality that you can unlock on top of it. Um, you know, things like budgeting, alerting, et cetera. But there's also a bunch of configuration that can be relevant for different organizations and how they operate Kubernetes. And really one of the big dimensions here is the decisions that a, a centralized DevOps or infrastructure team would be making versus decisions that in, in like decentralized uh, application or product engineering teams would be making. And one example that I'll, I'll just quickly walk through is this notion of, of allocating idle resources. And so be because we're actually looking at the cost of you know, each individual resource, the backing VMs, the backing you know, storage blocks, et cetera, we know the cost of a cluster. So allocating the full cost of a cluster can take the slack capacity or idle capacity and actually charge it to the individual tenants. So by default, this would be done proportionately based on the amount of resources that each individual tenant, whether a tenant be a, 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 a team, an application or another concept, and distribute those slack capacity uh, costs accordingly. And so that's just one example. And there are a, a number of others in terms of you know, a decision to, to actually taking these calculations and rolling them out to you know, a real world organization where there's you know, lots of different departments, engineering teams, et cetera. Another example would be a notion of like shared overhead. Oftentimes teams will have a, a centralized set of namespaces or set of labels where they have say like monitoring or logging uh, or, or just general system resources that they actually want to share with their individual tenants. These, there's a long list of these kind of decisions to think through how to kind of, you know, do this allocation at the organization level uh, before you really start thinking about rolling out something like, you know, show back or, or charge back to your individual application engineering team. So that's the, you know, walk through on, on a demo. Uh, I will turn it over to Jay now to talk 
more about kind of the backing architecture uh, and where we can go from here. Cool, thanks Webb. Um, so in general, right, uh, kind of the philosophy, we'll start with kind of the philosophy of how we're architecting this, right? So we wanna integrate with kind of the, the off the shelf open source metrics and monitoring stack that most, uh, you know, cloud native Kubernetes uh, people are using, right? So um, we, you know, at the, at the kind of cloud metric level, we build these, you know, we, we pull our, uh, like, use our requests, right? So pod requests, um, PV requests, all that kind of stuff out of cube state metrics. Um, there's several node level metrics from the, the node exporter. Um, and then, you know, stuff like container CPU cycles, uh, like actual memory usage come out of um, C advisor. Um, and then we have, we have also released like our own network uh, monitoring daemon set that we, that we pull into Prometheus as well. Um, okay, and then on the kind of like the cube cost side, the actual pod that we run, um, we pull in additional data directly from the, your Kubernetes API server. Um, mainly focused on like, uh, you know, how long has a pod been running? Um, you know, what namespace deployment replica set, et cetera, it was running in right now, um, all that kind of stuff, uh, as well as billing data from a number of sources, your, your cloud providers, um, like publicly available API, um, you know, potentially if you're using spot or reserved instances, those would, those may come from either like, uh, we have, you know, integrations with private APIs, um, you know, where you can publish that as like a list of pricings. Um, we also, uh, you know, if you get some sort of custom pricing, we also can hit your like cost update reports on GCP, AWS, um, and look at like the actual price of your, your like amortized reserved instance cost, for instance, or your, your spot, what you actually paid on the spot market. Um, so that data kind of gets joined with all the, the open source monitoring stack data and pushed back into Prometheus. Um, and yeah, then we, you know, kind of build a like caching layer, export some of that data and, uh, you know, make it available uh, as, an, as an API uh, that, you know, developers can query and you know, build stuff against. Um, yeah, uh, that's kind of <laughs> the the thousand foot overview there. There's additional stuff where we can join, like write this data to, to Thanos. And this can actually be, uh, I know it says Prometheus here, but this can be any kind of Prometheus-like uh, API, right? So this could be Thanos, Cortex. Um, you know, if you had all these metrics available in some like proprietary system, that's possible as well, although we, you know, there'd be, we find those don't typically scale in the same ways, but uh, definitely possible. Um, yeah, that's kind of the, the architecture and uh, uh, turn it over for, I think questions are next, right? Or do we have a, another slide here? Yep. <laughs> oh yeah, so this is uh, totally all available on um, GitHub for the core cost allocation models. That's open source, we have a, uh, Helm installation as well that's open source. We've also started a number of other interesting open source capacity planning projects. So there's like uh, a scheduled turndown uh, uh, mechanism that, um, you know, kind of instead of using like actual metrics to, to turn stuff down as in the cluster autoscaler, we can just declaratively say that we want to turn off our dev clusters at a certain time um, or something like that. Um, and uh, you know, just a number of interesting uh, capacity planning, cost management stuff in addition to the, the cost model. So come check out the long list of our repositories and uh, tons of interesting open issues to look through as well. Awesome, uh, really great, interesting stuff. Um, I think you've probably covered a lot of the questions that I'm seeing in chat in your presentation, uh, but I'll go ahead and, and repeat some of these and maybe you can add a little bit of additional color from uh, what you already discussed. 
so let's dig a little bit into, um, I'm just trying to get my notes, but all right, so uh, about uh, getting costs. So if you have a, a Kubernetes cluster in which you have several tenants, the, the shared resources, the common cost that you talked about uh, a little bit earlier, can you dig into that a little bit? George Gonzalez uh, asked about that. Yeah, absolutely, Ariel. Thanks for for passing the questions along. First of all, um, and and George, happy happy to share more here. Um, we have kind of three different mechanisms for for doing this, which I think is you know represents kind of common scenario. The first is uh, just taking some you know fixed external cost. This could be a software license. This could be the cost of your DevOps team. Um, this could be you know some just totally external costs. Uh, to your cluster, and then actually applying that back as a shared resource. Uh, the second is actually using a shared namespace. Again, a, a common example is you have a monitoring namespace with a bunch of uh, observability workloads. And then the third approach would be using a, a shared label. Um, so again, that could be you know app equals monitoring or app equals logging. And then how it's actually applied, we have two different options that are supported by our, our APIs today. The first is that those resources are proportionately applied back to tenants. So if one tenant, say, you know, one namespace is using 75% of cluster resources, it would get 75% of the shared resource. So that's option one. Um, option two is you can actually distribute that uniformly. Um, so, you know, there it would just be, you know, if you have five tenants, every tenant would be re receive, you know, one fifth of that shared cost. Um, and again, I, I think here when we, you know, talk about be best practices and application of this, I, I think it's that, you know, situation matters and it really gets down to kind of what that workload is or what those shared workloads are and how they're being consumed and who kind of controls the decision in terms of, you know, where those are deployed and, and you know, the costs of those ultimately. Okay. Continuing along kind of uh, the, this aspect, it, there's a lot of questions about how you, and I think uh, AJ touched on it in saying that there's some private APIs that you will map into in order to get pricing information. And there seem to be a fair amount of questions around uh, what, uh, the, what cost centers or what price API, pricing APIs uh, there's compatibility or, or, or are integrated uh, into uh, the solution. So, gosh, I saw Azure somewhere in there. Yep. Uh, definitely a AWS. Can you can you speak a little bit about maybe what what the what's in scope and out of scope? Like what? Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, do you want to take this one, Jay? After yeah, you. sure. I'll, I'll take this one. Um, okay. Yeah. So this is uh, there's a lot of different ground to cover here, right? So at kind of the base level, right? So this comes for free without, I mean, obviously everything is, is free. I mean, when I say free, I mean, uh, you know, uh, like without doing any additional configuration. So what you get is uh, a connection to the GCP standard uh, billing API, the AWS standard like uh, billing API and the Azure standard billing API. Um, or if you're running this, uh, on premises, you just get some default, you get a default price uh, kind of that uh, we feel is representative of your, you know, your, your second best option at GCP or, a, or Azure or something like that. Um, so those are all connected to, you know, the public available, uh, the publicly available APIs that uh, Azure, uh, Google and Amazon publish. Um, now to do reserved instances and spot instance pricing, what you would do is give the KubeCost pod, um, you know, either an IAM role or a service account, something like that to go and hit your billing data report. Um, and once we get the first pull of that billing data report, our prices will update to reflect the new information there. Um, what we have support for there are um, Amazon, uh, sorry, excuse me, AWS, reserved instances, uh, AWS spot prices. Uh, I think they're called preemptible nodes on GCP. Um, and uh, I think that's what we have. I think Azure has recently come out with like a new set of preemptible nodes 
or a new type of preemptible nodes as they've migrated away from like spot. Um, there's like VM scale sets, things like that. So uh, that are not yet available um, as publicly available pricing APIs, uh, APIs. And that's where we can actually go deeper with your organization and say, okay, you guys have a custom like negotiated pricing sheet. Um, and if you publish that as in a particular interface, um, we can consume that and apply that to your uh, nodes um, and persistent volumes and asset prices and things like that. Um, hopefully that answers the question. I know there's a lot of different prices that you could be billed. Um, so uh, pretty in depth there. So I guess digging it a little more into that, there's some questions uh, around uh, GPU consumption and network cost. Uh, so can you speak a little bit, I guess, uh, around that? Is there a difference in looking at GPU cost uh, and how you're factoring that in? Or can, can you, as an example, uh, but yeah. also discuss network cost and egress traffic and uh, yeah, those, yeah. I think that um, seems so to. I can sort of take GPU like kind of from the ground up, right? So um, one thing like GPUs aren't really like multi-tenant yet. So uh, I believe that in most of the cloud providers as well as like on-premises generally in general, and um, again, not exactly, there's lots of custom ways to do this on-premises, but uh, you declare uh, GPU as a Kubernetes resource at the pod level and a pod gets assigned the, the fully loaded cost of the, of the GPU, right? It's, a, it's very similar to like a persistent volume or some other custom resource. Um, there's not really like, I mean, obviously you may not be using 100% of the GPU, but um, as far as I know in Google Cloud, uh, et cetera, you are still like attached, you've attached the whole GPU to the pod. So that pod gets the full cost of its like GPU request. Um, I'm not sure if that exactly answers the question, but yeah, th those prices are all publicly available on the API or you can declare it yourself. Um, no, yeah. I thought that was a great overview. Um, yeah. Ariel, I'm happy to talk about network costs if, if that would be helpful as like a separate topic as well. Yeah, yeah, and you mentioned PVCs and being from that app, I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, yeah. have you dig into that uh, also. <laughs> so yeah, PVC, PVCs are actually interesting also in that they're very similar to like GPUs, right? In the sense that like, you, a pod says, I want a PVC or a GPU or some custom resource, right? Like these are all, I think PVs kind of like post date nodes, right? As a, as a Kubernetes resource. So a lot of these additional resources that aren't nodes, like you assign them to a pod and the pod is the full cost of them, not like a partial cost of them um, because the whole resource is given pod, even if you're only using 20%. Um, so yeah, and then Webb, if you want to talk about network costs. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, so, so network cost is, is actually done slightly differently. Network costs actually, because there's no like source of truth in terms of, you know, obviously like a resource request or anything that Kubernetes API, we actually have a Linux uh, module direct integration. So we can actually see, you know, source and destination uh, IP and port combination. And so once we have that data, we combine that with an internal map of all of your endpoints in a cluster. So we would have, you know, every service address, every endpoint address, et cetera. And then we would use re for, for endpoints that are inside of a cluster, we would allow the ability to look at say, you know, is the source uh, and, and destination, uh, you know, different in terms of AZ, different in terms of region, et cetera. And so we would do all that mapping within a cluster but then obviously if you're using some sort of, you know, like external IP address, we wouldn't have visibility into where that is going exactly. We actually give you the ability to classify specific CIDR blocks or IP address ranges to where you could say, okay, yes, this IP address is outside of my cluster, but it's actually an RDS database that is in our VPC. So it should not be billed as internet egress, for example, uh, because it's in the same, you know, AZ or same A same region. So all of that would say, you know, we would be doing all that behind the scenes to ultimately give you the amount of like bytes and then the cost of those bytes that you are egressing to the internet, you know, egressing cross region, egressing cross zone and like emitting within your, your AZ as well. Okay. Awesome.
Awesome. Let's uh, let's talk a little bit about integrations as folks are uh, discussing things like, uh, you know, can Prometheus be replaced with Datadog? I saw New Relic mentioned also. Uh, so what kind of composability or, or, or integrations are possible uh, when, when setting up KubeCost? Yeah, that, so that starts to like bleed into, you know, like outside of the open source, like, you know, our, our company efforts. Um, and short story there is kind of, you know, two different paths. Um, we work with teams to like get data ingested into their, you know, BI tool, whether it's a, you know, external solution, like one of the ones mentioned or some sort of proprietary internal, you know, set of dashboards, et cetera. Um, so that's kind of, you know, one thing that we work with, with enterprises on. And then the second is that because we are writing a lot of these raw metrics back to, you know, Prometheus, uh, they can, you have a lot of interesting integrations with like alert manager and, you know, Prometheus metric exporters. So there's a lot of flexibility and a lot of things you, you kind of get for free with, with that capability. Yeah. And again, want to, you know, at the, really, you know, want to stay kind of focused on the open source during the scope of this talk and not kind of like company stuff, but um, generally like you could hit, you know, a lot of these, um, external solutions have like a Prometheus, like you can issue Prometheus queries to them and they can take Prometheus data and, you know, don't, but again, want to be sensitive about scale there, right? Like, cause we know you're probably paying per like byte egress or some queer, something on Datadog, right? And, um, you know, these, these can actually get uh, pretty large, right? Like, let's say you want to look at like a, like per container costs, over you know 90 days right so how much of that container were you sampling right if you were sampling this every minute for a single container right so one minute over the course of 90 days um don't think we do the math right now but it, it, it's a large number right and and these these costs sort of add up so again just you can plug this anywhere it's just kind of like at what scale right so we've um done a lot of work to to, to optimize this for you know the common open source stack which is like uh, Prometheus, um, you know, Thanos, uh, potentially Cortex, uh, it, but like whether you can go and like try and pull a year's worth of data out of Datadog, like, uh, you know, don't, couldn't tell you the price of that or like how that's going to work exactly. Yeah. Cool. And I guess to dig a little bit into uh, that, that business side of it, is it uh, so what is open source and what, uh, to, to your point about services, what, or is there an enterprise edition? Uh, uh, can you speak a little yeah. bit to your open core model? Yeah, absolutely. So, so just like you mentioned, you know, we, we do have an open core model, all of the like calculations, all the like allocation, everything we talked about today is, is fully in our open source. So that's kind of the raw underlying engine that produces these metrics. Um, from there are, are like, we have two different paid tiers, a business tier and an enterprise tier. Um, there it's talking about really now that you have that core visibility, how do you deploy that scale one, you know, and that's, you know, scale in terms of many, you know, pods, nodes, jobs, et cetera, but also how do you retain that data for a long time? Because a lot of, larger companies want to have this data for a year or two years plus. Um, secondly, it's, it's integrating it with your enterprise infrastructure. So, you know, things like SSO and SAML and, you know, existing BI tools, all of these like enterprise integrations that are, are really important in a big company setting, but are kind of less relevant in an, in an open source setting. Um, and then, you know, on top of that, now that you have this visibility, we want to help teams be really efficient in their environments, right? So we, in our paid products and our UI associated with our paid products, have a bunch of insights, you know, things like, you know, pod right sizing, cluster right sizing, that Jay mentioned, uh, like an implementation of, you know, cluster turndown, all these tools that are kind of built on top of this, like, really interesting visibility. Yeah, and then uh, the one other thing there is, uh, just so, you know, support for doing this multi cross account as well, right? So like, you know, yeah. if you've got kind of like, you know, kind of a natural fit to like do this more easily is like if you're kind of like, you've got like a master payer account on Amazon, right? And like, 
how do you do auth in a way that's you know reasonable against the master payer and all these constituent clusters and 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 that kind of stuff. Um, so that's so so multi account as well. Okay, Let, let's dig a little bit into. There's a, a couple things that you talked about and uh, that are related to some themes here and questions on prem, uh, right? What about running on prem VMware PKS clusters? Uh, uh, you know, is there some way? Uh, Let's just go with on-prem. I think that's an umbrella that will cover some of these questions here that I'm seeing. Absolutely. We have a bunch of users that are using this on-prem. We also have a bunch of users that are using this in hybrid, right? So your AWS and on-prem or you know, even multi-cloud you know, as well as on-prem. Um, the way this is supported in the project today is actually twofold. Uh, so the, the simple version is you can provide you know, a default cost of resource of a resource that's fully modified. So you can say, you know, here's the cost of a CPU, here's the cost of a GPU, et cetera. Um, in that approach, you can actually have two different classes of these different resources. So you could say, you know, here's, you know, on demand and here's spot or here's type one and here's type two in terms of CPU cost. So just, you know, two different tiers. But then we have a third, uh, or excuse me, a, a second solution, which would allow you to have just, you know, total configuration and actually do a price per, you know, asset ID. So you would just have a unique, you know, label or annotation in your node spec. So you can actually map essentially CSV pricing data back to an individual node. So that's kind of the, you know, the more advanced mechanism where you can be much more precise if you have a lot of, um, you know, Hetero, heterogeneous, uh, like, you know, different, you know, VMs, different asset types across your organization. Is, uh, uh, is cube cuts being used in aiding for, uh, forecasting or capacity planning for cluster resources? If so, can you expand on that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. I, I would say that, you know, the first, the first use case is, is typically just starting with that visibility, right? So, you know, we're, we're spending X dollars, where's that being broken down between, you know, different applications, teams, departments, et cetera. Um, but we, we absolutely have teams using, uh, you know, this data for forecasting today. Um, in our product specifically, and, and actually in these APIs, we expose what we call like, um, you know, projected rate data or just rate data. So there you'd be able to say, you know, if I look back over the last say 24 hours, even if a cluster wasn't running for that entire, entire time period, what's kind of the run rate of the expenses, you know, th that I'm uh, seeing based on the, the resources that are being provisioned or consumed. So that's, that's, you know, a simple way of doing that forecasting. Uh, we have a lot more in the works to do you know, something you know, more advanced there. And, and also we see teams that would say, take that data and like ingest it into a, a BI tool and do some of that on that end as well. Yep. Um, I, we would just say that, you know, we think that we have, we're helping teams with the base level forecasting today, but obviously there can be a lot of nuances to, you know, doing that on an individual like application basis, et cetera. And yeah, just, just to jump on here, right? Like forecasting is really important for getting your costs down, but like the, the number one thing we see today is, is not, forecasting it's like misconfiguration or mistuning right so we've got tooling that'll tell you like hey maybe the cluster auto scale is not being aggressive enough here because the cluster auto scaler you know uh, as great as it is just like has these like sets of strong guarantees about what it can and cannot do right and you as you know the the devops engineer or the per or the you know the the person running these clusters often have an insight that's like hey like the cluster autoscaler can't turn down Grafana because Grafana is using local storage for something, but like Grafana doesn't need to use local storage because everything is backed by this configuration file. So go ahead and like mark it as safe for turn off. So there's, there's two kinds of things. There's that projection that we're talking about as well as just like monitoring that, you know, the tools you're running today are using or like allocating your resources the way that you want them to be allocated. Um, so there's, you know, both both sides. So to, to follow up on that slightly differently is that what's the impact of uh, running uh, this uh, in your environment? 
So what's the impact of performance? What is the, the... Yeah, so you can think about um, like this being a, a function of, of scale. Um, what we think about when we look at scale is uh, specifically like Prometheus scale. Um, so we would be looking at the number of unique, you know, vectors that are being scraped, um, the, the churn of those metrics over time. Um, so like it, the short answer is it d depends on the environment. Um, but if you look at our product today, um, we, we have it to where we, it can be run in several ways. One is either with a bundled Prometheus where you use our Helm chart and we just deploy Prometheus for you and it's standalone. And then the other is to reuse an existing Prometheus. Um, we, we generally steer teams towards using a separate Prometheus just because our Prometheus has a greatly scoped down number of metrics. We typically use around like 10% of the resources that a like standard, you know, like Prometheus stable or Prometheus operator deployment would. So, you know, it, it would be very much tuned to like only collect what is relevant for, for like cost and capacity management, one. And then two, we have essentially like an ETL pipeline in our application to where we would be building this caching layer so that you're not constantly going to Prometheus, um, like, you know, say a Grafana would and just running these queries directly. You instead would be hitting a, you know, free warm cache to be able to do these like relevant lookbacks, like you know, last thirty days, last ninety days, etc. Okay, uh, to shift a little bit to back into the, the the forecasting, and I, I hear you, AJ, but John uh, has <laughs> asked a couple of questions here uh, that I want to get to. Um, and the earliest one was cube cost. It's, it's, it's related to forecasting in the sense of cube, co cube cost replacement of nodes with spot and preemptible nodes in the future. I suspect he's asking, can I look at what I'm consuming today and be like, oh, this could be addressed with spot or preemptible instances and can the system take that action? John, feel free to correct me <laughs> in chat. Yeah, Ajay, I'll yeah. let you. Yeah, um, I mean, this. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, okay, so two things. Um, one is recommendations, right? So we kind of see this in, in two pieces, right? So uh, I think we will, <laughs> I think he's predicting what we're doing a little bit. Like, I think soon we'll be releasing something that says like, like check mark this workload is spot ready. It, it is not running on a spot instance, but could be, right? Um, or like, we already have today a number of things that say like, we have a, um, you know, we, we actually have a, have a simple heuristic slash philosophy about how you should be reserving instances, like um, reserve up to like the sum of your requests, right? You know, you're going to use that much because you've reserved, you, you've had requests, right? So right size all your requests, reserve that sum. We have a, we have a graph that can show that um, like reservation versus usage um, forecast. Um, we also have like, you know, I think just in general checklists that tell you is something um, working, right? And okay, so I think John John is asking prefer about proactive mechanisms. Um, I would say like those are coming, right? So we have got this idea of like scheduled cluster turndowns that's like proactive in a sense that like you can declaratively say a schedule and like turn some stuff off. And, um, you know, we think kind of, <laughs> Thanks, John. Um, uh, says turn down is cool. Um, so, like these <laughs> proactive mechanisms uh, are are coming. We just think there's just like a higher bar for making sure like everything is like working and like we we iron out all of the like edge cases here about like actually turning stuff down. And there are things like the cluster auto scaler that are proactive, but you know, because they're proactive, there's a, uh, like I was talking about earlier, there's just like a level of, I don't know if aggressiveness is the right word, but like a level of uh, stability that they have to maintain. And those can interact in interesting and, you know, perhaps wrong ways with like the actual state of your infrastructure, right? Like, let's say you were running the cluster autoscaler on a development environment, right? Like, and you're using this development environment to do a scale test, right? Well, Cluster Autoscaler is going to go ahead and ramp up your development environment, right? It doesn't have this notion of what's running and why. 
um, that we think <laughs> uh, is um, you know very relevant. That, that kind of like the insights that a DevOps engineer has, right? Like so, there may be a world in the future where like some kind of you know uh, proactive action totally replaces like and an, like a SRE or like a DevOps manager. Um, and, you know, I think at that point you will find me like on a beach somewhere uh, because our jobs will be done. But uh, until then, uh, uh, you know, it's a combination, right? So like assist and proactive and be conservative on your proactive tools. And again, there's lot, like lots of great open source options. We're also building some in that space as well, like Turndown. And then like be, be really aggressive in, in showing this data back to DevOps engineers and like really uh, digging in and making recommendations and, and leaving like a human in the loop to, to do this, this turndown. And um, obviously, you know, organizations are different, but like, you know, if you're, if you're the on-call engineer, like, you know, open it up once in the morning, take a look at like, if anything has happened and hopefully like we can help you do that analysis in a couple of minutes and, you know, um, go about the rest of your day and let your automated scripts run and then take a look again tomorrow morning. Ajay, you did hit on one thing that I think is yep. like relevant that we haven't pointed out is by default, uh, you know, like this open source project and actually all of our projects take read only permissions, you know, out of the gate. Right. And, and so we do want to be really thoughtful about how we like incrementally request more privileges. And obviously something like, you know, cluster turndown would be something that can be optionally enabled and you know access can be granted to that particular you know pod that would be performing those actions um so you know we just want to be super thoughtful there by you know teams that just want this core visibility that they wouldn't need to give this you know right permissions on in any level uh that's kind of one thing and then second of all one thing i just want to highlight that i think was probably relevant but was or, or like never directly mentioned is that all data uh, that is produced and read by a product lives in, in your environment, right? You don't have to egress this data. You don't have to share this data with like us as an external service or, or any other service for that matter. Okay. I think there's no better way to end this one uh, than with those two great answers. Um, if you, if, if you're still, if, for those who are still here, uh, they can meet you at team at kubecost.com. Uh, the project's available on GitHub. Uh, any other ways they can uh, or should contact you? Is there a tw Twitter handle or anything else? Uh, Slack, Slack. Yeah, there's <laughs> a... A Join Slack the Slack. Workplace. Yeah, yeah, we should put that on our on our slides. Um, All right, maybe. You, you, to, uh, uh -huh. you can tweet at me directly. It's at a J or something like that. But <laughs> or All Instagram. Right. Okay. You know, <laughs> that's so, the new one. How we can share it is that later today, yeah. uh, uh, this deck, uh, we, we can add it there, uh, and the recording uh, will be available. Uh, so. Uh, you can go ahead and, 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 and grab that information there also. Um, and uh, thank you all for attending and we look forward to seeing you at the future CNCF webinar. Uh, have a great day. Thank you so much, yes. everyone.